<laughs> Hi, everybody. Welcome to our last uh, webinar in our Friday lunch seminar series. Um, just a few things to note before we get started on today's talk about flea beetles. Um, all the attendees will be muted, but you can um, ask questions at any time through the questions box, which is on the panel on the right hand side, which you can sort of open and close using the orange arrow. Um, so feel free to submit questions um, throughout the webinar and we'll have a discussion at the end um, about different management strategies that we talked about today. And um, we're recording this presentation and we'll be uploading it on our website uh, soon. So with that, um, today's webinar is gonna be about flea beetles and um, Dan Gilrain and Farouk Zaman will be um, presenting from Cornell Cooperative Extension on Long Island. So thanks, Dan, Farouk. Okay. Thank you, Sue, and uh, I should include uh, my associate, Dr. Farouk Zaman's uh, name on this slide as well. But we're here to talk about flea beetles, which is a nemesis of many brassica growers, perhaps, perhaps the most ser serious problem uh, for organic growers to deal with, and I am keeping that in mind throughout this discussion. Um, and please, as uh, Sue mentioned, include your questions or comments um, in that question box, or, any, or you can also follow up with us later on. Um, so today, we're, this is the subject of our talk. This is the crucifer flea beetle. This is an imported pest um, brought to the, or found in the Western US, Western Canada around 1921 and since spread from there and now become a real, real thorn in our sides of dealing with. And this is not the only one. We have a couple of uh, species to deal with, but you can see the beetles themselves and the damage that they're causing and it's getting to be pretty substantial in this particular case. So this is a list of the the flea beetles that we have, um, at least that are known in this region. The Crucifer flea beetle and striped flea beetle are the two most important ones, and mostly it's Crucifer flea beetle, but we see both here, and I am aware of both in most areas, and it could be that striped flea beetle is more important in some areas than others. Um, these are almost exclusively dedicated to brassicas, but they will feed on a few other hosts uh, that contain some of the same chemicals that give brassicas their distinctive odor and flavor. Uh, uh, plants related to say nasturtium have been seen attacked as well. Although I can't say I've ever seen a flea beetle uh, damage on nasturtiums myself. Um, there are another uh, uh, set of flea beetles that are around the area. Most of these are native. There's horseradish flea beetle, garden flea beetle, Zimmermans, and hop flea beetles. Some of them look quite similar to striped feet of flea beetles. Some of them are quite different. I myself have never encountered most of these. We've had one case of horseradish flea beetle that I can recall, but I've really never run into the rest of these. Uh, Crucifer flea beetle seems to have pushed them all off the, off the page. This is horseradish flea beetle, and you can see it looks quite different from either one of those two that were shown in the pictures earlier and the damage to horseradish uh, on, the, on the lower right there. This is almost exclusively dedicated to horseradish, but it will feed on a few other brassicas. And I should mention that these flea beetles do feed on other brassica weeds and they are hosts for both the adults and the larval stage. So when we think about flea beetles, think about their environment and what they like to feed on, uh, not just the crops that we're trying to raise. The, the problem involves uh, the weed hosts as well. Uh, this is just to reiterate the list of flea beetles of concern, and I've highlighted the fact that horseradish and Zimmerman flea beetle are unique in that they have larval stages that will mine the leaves, the other ones have immature or larval stages that are in the root zone. And they're, so because they're out of sight, they're often out of mind, but I think we want to be thinking about that a little bit more in the, in the time as time goes on, particularly as we're doing research to try to address this problem. So this is sort of a generalized life cycle of what flea beetles are doing uh, throughout their life and where they are. Uh, the uh, adults will overwinter and so in about a month or so, we'll start to see them coming out and feeding on your transplants that you've so generously provided in the spring. They'll lay eggs at the base of those plants, the larvae will hatch, and uh, there's three different larval stages. They'll feed for a time and eventually pupate. And then we'll start to see the summer generation of adults emerge probably around 
uh, late late uh, Juneish or so. It depends on where you're located when you first start to see some. And so you get some overlap sometimes between the overwintered adults and then the next generation of uh, of adults that's coming on. So here's some of the damage again. There's a little flea beetle on the top. Um, the issue of flea beetles really depends upon a lot of different different situations or concerns. Um, certainly seedlings are very vulnerable and young transplants as well. You can sustain very serious damage in a short time. It can affect their growth or kill them. Um, there's also the concern for the cosmetic kind of appearance on older plants and what that means for trying to sell these the crop at sale. Um, that may or may not be a problem depending on the crop and the severity and how you market. Uh, we have one grower here, for example, that sells through a CSA and they have a fairly high tolerance for holes and injury in their arugula and other crops, but commercial growers that are selling to the general public have a much, much lower tolerance. And so the kinds of thresholds and the kinds of tolerances and, and how you respond to it is going to be different depending on your market and your concerns and the stage of the crop and growth and so on. Besides the physical damage that they cause, uh, flea beetles specifically, the Christopher flea beetle has been implicated in transmission or spread of alternaria, a fungal disease in cabbage. I recall that work um, from many years ago. Helene Dillard at Geneva Experiment Station reported on that. Um, it's also been investigated to see whether they have any role in spreading black rot. That's a bacterial disease around. Some of you might remember what a horrible problem that was in red Russian kale a few years ago. Um, and it still can, can be a problem you know, each year for some people. And the symptoms on the right. Um, it's been found they can carry it in lab studies, but we really have no evidence for sure that they're able to carry and transmit or spread it in a field situation. But I think, still think the jury's a little bit out on that. And if you have a lot of flea beetles and black rot, um, it's probably not a good thing. So, so this is just the Nebraska scouting calendar I showed during one of my earlier presentations. And it just gives you an indication. This is based on Ontario um, of when they are expecting flea beetle problems to be uh, present and most serious. And uh, we see the overwintering adults sometimes early May, usually a little bit later, extending into June, and then the summer adults coming on. Um, often later in June, early July. So again, you can get some overlap and the adults can continue to be a problem through August, uh, diminishing as they go. And there may even be a partial additional uh, late summer generation as well. I don't think we have really good information on how much that occurs, or how serious that is, um, but that would be really interesting to know more about and could have great implications for how we deal with flea beetle problems. So we talked about scouting, and that's um, a cornerstone of our IPM program that we offer to growers here on Long Island. And I, it's one way we are able to alert growers to a problem with flea beetles in different parts of a field, at different stages of crop growth. And we have some thresholds that are indicated here. We talked about how to do some scouting, and there's some guidelines. Uh, I believe UMass has some as well. And we have uh, guidelines that we offer and, um, and can provide if you're interested. But there's a list of some thresholds. I would qualify those, saying they're not very well established scientifically. They're, I would see, best guesses. And you can certainly come up with your own thresholds, depending on your crop and tolerances, stages, and so forth in your market. Um, so these are just some examples of thresholds that have been used for cabbage. I would say, in general, have a very, very low tolerance for seedlings. Of course, that just makes sense. Um, and um, keep your eyes on newly planted transplants because as you get higher, higher in populations, particularly the summer generation, you can get pretty serious damage in a short time too. So those probably bear the most close watching as well as crops getting close to sale if there is low tolerance of injury. A lot of different strategies have been talked about for flea beetles and I think these all have to be looked at very critically. Uh, certainly one criticism I have with a lot of information that you'll read online, particularly in organic literature, is they talk about things that you can do. Well, there's a lot of things you can do, but what we really need to know is what kind of research backs any of that up to guide how you spend your money and your time and where you're gonna get the most bang for your, for your buck or your effort. Um, so here's a list of a bunch of different options that have been discussed in terms of managing the beetle. We talked about monitoring and scouting. Um, it's been suggested even to schedule planting, delay it to late July. That's 
that sounds like a nice idea. You could get beyond where uh, the peak of the summer generation is, is uh, serious, but of course that's totally impractical because you have to have a crop in earlier. Uh, trap cropping or intercropping has been looked at. I'll mention a little bit more on trap cropping in a moment, but there is actually a paper on intercropping using some of these listed plants and showing that they have decreased flea beetle numbers in the nearby brassicas. That could be possibly practical depending on the kind of fields you're dealing with, how big they are, how much space you have available, how much time you want to fuss around with growing these other kinds of things. And some of these like tansy are um, have the potential to be somewhat invasive as, uh, as uh, perennials. Uh, mulches have been looked at a little bit. I can't say I'm very impressed with and these are, I'm talking about organic mulches, was what uh, kind of relief those offer for flea beetle control. Um, it hasn't really been looked at too well, um, uh, say, uh, uh, looking at planting into stubble or a fallow type situation as to how that might contribute or decrease. Uh, so that could be looked at, I think, a little bit more. Uh, sanitation, rotation, those are concepts that I think sound good and seem reasonable to try to destroy overwintering sites and debris where they could be hanging out. But I also think that might be useful to control the below ground stages if it's thoughtfully timed. Uh, so when those larvae are there feeding on roots, could we possibly use some kind of sanitation or cultivation to disrupt them before they get to the pupation stage or begin to emerge? And could that be effective? Uh, trapping has been looked at. I recall um, seeing in an organic uh, journal, uh, the concept of putting sticky traps up in front of a tractor as it drives over a row and trapping flea beetles as it goes along. That I don't think has been tested to my knowledge uh, to see if that could be used, but that seemed like an interesting way of looking at trapping um, that maybe needs to be examined. Uh, row cover netting, we'll talk more about that. That's pretty effective. Uh, cultivation, I mentioned that a little bit with the sanitation. Uh, education is certainly part of it. I mentioned the CSA here that is, uh, has a fairly low, uh, high tolerance for injury on some of their leafy brassicas. And if I think the public can be more accepting of, of that than um, the less we need to uh, stress high levels of control. Biological control, there's been a little bit of uh, work into that or looking at that. There's not much known on it that I can find anyway. And uh, so a little, a few things that are mentioned here doesn't seem to be terribly effective as you could uh, imagine, just judging from the high populations we see some of the times. Uh, and so it's a pretty consistently, uh, flea beetles are pretty consistently bad. So the biologicals are obviously not doing their job, but maybe there's ways we can enhance that. Insecticides is what we usually uh, depend upon quite a bit. So we'll talk about that in some detail and some of the other work that we're doing that I think will be helpful to you. Um, at least in terms of monitoring, some have been looking at um, whether we can use sticky traps, colored sticky traps, to determine when flea beetles are becoming active. Would that be an easy way to detect them rather than having to walk throughout the whole field in every area? Um, I don't know if we have a complete answer to that, but the answer, but we do know that sticky traps will attract them and trap them. I don't think it's really a control strategy at this point, but more for monitoring. So there was some work done, uh, reported in 1986 in, from Canada. Charles Rinsford and Art Stewart did this uh, looking in rutabagas, and they found that um, pretty much any of the colored traps they tested, red, green, two different kinds of yellow or white, were uh, almost equally effective in trapping these beetles, red being the least of all. They did see that the striped flea beetles were somewhat more attracted to white. There was at least a couple of data points there showing where they were uh, slightly more attracted to white. Um, the yellow number one would be equivalent to the uh, yellow streaky traps that are commercially available. So the bottom line is that the yellow traps are fine and you can get those. So if you wanna put some of those out to trap, uh, uh, see if you can trap and monitor or detect flea beetles, that's okay. Keep in mind yellow is fairly indiscriminate in what it traps and attracts. You may get a, a few bumblebees as well that are attracted to the yellow as well as other non-target species. Um, the resource guide for organic insect and disease management is probably the best reference that I know of if you do organic management of insects because it actually is uh, summarizing information based upon research. There isn't really very much in there on 
of flea beetles, unfortunately. There's a little bit, but uh, it can give you some guidance on this, but uh, especially on other kinds of things. So if you're looking at alternatives and, and efficacy. There's a publication out of uh, uh, the Pacific Northwest on organic management flea beetles. You'll see that up there. And the photo to the right was taken from that publication. And they report on work that was done in Washington State looking at efficacy of a trap crop um, uh, composed of a mix of attractive brassicas that are planted nearby um, th their cash crop, which in this case is broccoli. And they were saying and stating that they had significant control of the flea beetles by using this tactic. They didn't provide any data uh, to support that, unfortunately. Um, so that would be nice to see how uh, the degree to which that worked, how effective it was. Um, but that would have, probably have to be done sort of thoughtfully because these uh, mixed trap crops can get out of attractive stage pretty quickly. And so there might need to be some kind of successional planting to deal with that. But I think one of the things that could have been looked at even more is could we use these to trap not just the adults or draw them out, but could we also use these to to uh, control the larval stage as well by tilling under some of these uh, as they get beyond where they're attractive to the adults and the next attractive trap crop comes on. They also looked at uh, planting as a border, as you'll see in the lower right, maybe using it at a border planting rather than in rows near the uh, uh, cash crop. And that worked also pretty well, according to them. Um, we've looked at row cover a couple different kinds. This is an agro uh, spun on a polyester. This was being done mainly for cabbage maggot control, but no surprise, it actually works to control other things too, including flea beetles. And Farouk will talk more about this, and he's done some work looking at this uh, uh, netting, uh, technic netting, and there's other kinds, and he'll discuss that. But that also can work quite well, and we have some growers using that uh, right now. I want to talk about some studies, and I must apologize since this is going to be a little heavy on charts and data, and that can get tiresome pretty quickly, but I want to give you a sense that there's been a lot of work done, and so what some of the results have been and how they compare and how variable it's been. So this is going to be a series of three studies that were done in UMass and reported in 2006. For the, if many of you remember Ruth Hazard, uh, Roy Van Dreisch, and some others that were involved in this. So there's, they were... Uh, putting four applications of different insecticides that are listed on that bottom line, comparing it to row cover, vacuuming that was done twice a week, and uh, you can see all the materials there that were used. So the one material that really seemed to work the most effective was row cover. You were getting suppression of the flea beetles, all these other treatments. The vacuuming was not very, very effective and it also caused a lot of plant damage. So they dismissed that pretty, pretty clearly. Uh, the Spintor I wanna point out in this case is the formerly um, sold non-organic equivalent of Entrust has the same active ingredient. So you can see that there is apparently some suppression at least particular trial, but notice the Pyganic was not working well. The Ecozin, which is an Azadaractin, was just about equivalent to the Spintor and uh, so on and so forth. Um, this is a second trial they did. Also, the row cover looked really, really good. Uh, there's still pretty heavy pressure in this trial like there was in the last one. And the interesting thing in this particular study was they saw um, almost equivalent results, or pretty equivalent results between the Carbaryl or 7, which is a conventional standard, hot pepper wax, and Spintor. Hot pepper wax is not an organic product. It is a labeled pesticide. Um, but um, it is available and it looked like it was pretty good in this trial, so that might bear further looking. But you can definitely see that there's some effect from the Spintor. And if you, I think, would substitute the word in trust in there, you think you would have, uh, you, you would be reasonable in doing so. Um, this is a trial, a little more complicated, where the numbers of flea beetles looked at over a period of time. And um, I want to point out here on the uh, the row cover again is looking very well, this yellow line at the bottom, compared to the seven line. So the, this is the number of holes in the plants uh, that they're comparing now. And um, as you can see there, that the uh, row cover is even better than the seven. And, uh, and that's actually not too surprising when you keep all the flea beetles out. Um, these two middle lines, I'm looking at the green and a blue line. This is the Entrust and Spintor where they were, the two were compared. They're pretty equivalent. There really is not any difference in those two. So you can see that there is definitely significant suppression with these. And there were sprays put on. Uh, this is uh, five different times, which is, is quite a bit, but that's uh, what you might need with some of these materials that are not as highly effective and residual. I was interested in seeing uh, whether uh, we could um, reduce the cost 
because entrusta is a fairly expensive material. So can we reduce the rate and can we extend the interval um, to reduce the cost and frequency of the application? The answer is yes. So we're comparing here entrust at one ounce uh, versus three ounces applied on a 10 day versus a seven day interval. And you can see there is significant suppression. This is the damage. We're using damage ratings in this particular case. Um, so we got significantly less damage on plants treated with entrust. And I saw, saw no reason why you shouldn't be able to use the one ounce rate at the 10 day interval. Now this was the former wettable powder. So uh, the uh, low rate of the uh, liquid would be the uh, comparable alternative here. Uh, we looked at making choy because that's also an extremely attractive crop um, and uh, heavily damaged by flea beetles. And we're comparing here uh, the reduced risk insecticide as sale at two different formulations with um, the standard sort of Provado um, and, and trust both with uh, without or uh, with and without uh, ultrafine oil, a horticultural oil, to see if that could maybe enhance penetration leaf and improve the residual activity. Um, so here we're seeing um, kind of what you'd expect. The assail is working fairly well, reasonably well. It's not the most outstandingly effective material for a flea beetle, but it's pretty good. And we have uh, the two lines here for the entrust uh, with and without oil, they're pretty equivalent. So it really didn't help to add the oil, but in general, I think an adjuvant is a good idea if you're spraying any kind of a waxy leaved uh, brassica plant. I was really looking hard to find data with a Bovaria bassiana. This would be Mycotrol or Botanicard. Uh, and it's not easy to find that, but this trial is one done in Canola in Montana, and the list of treatments are there up above, and they're looking at applications applied to two, one, two, or four times versus conventional materials, delta methane and bifenthrin applied five times on a 10-day interval. So what I've highlighted here, and this is looking at the percentage of leaves with injury, and canola is a very different situation than most of the uh, vegetable brassicas were growing, so keep that in mind. But this middle one here, they used Bovaria on the first spray and MET52, which is another biological material. It's not labeled for brassicas, but they're comparing that, and that looked the best of all. All the treatments gave you some control, but that was really uh, the better one, and also compared favorably to the standard chemical treatment here, the bifenthrin that was used. And this is done at two different locations, uh, cut bank and sweet grass are the two sites. So that was good to see. Uh, I'd like to see that kind of work repeated here on some of the brassicas brass that we're using and growing. So here's a summary of some of the treatments that are insecticides anyway that are labeled. Um, many are conventional, a few are organic. I think you'll see probably the best results with Entrust. Um, I'd like to see more work done with Mycotrol and possibly Azera to see how well those would be performing for flea beetles. Uh, and with the Azera, it's probably going to be the Azadaractin, the neem component, more than the excuse me, the pyrethrin component that's in that product because we've not seen very good consistent results with Pyganic alone for flea beetle control. So those are some of the options, and many of these are listed in the New England Vegetable Management Guide as well as the Cornell Guidelines. And with that, I think I'll turn it over to Farouk, who will then talk to you about some of his work that he's been doing. Okay, thank you, Dan. Okay, so uh, 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 back into um, uh, last year, like in 2018, we actually conducted two trials at our uh, farm facilities at, in Riverhead, New York. Uh, we uh, did uh, one experiment with cabbage and then the other experiment with a, with bok choy, with a very fast growing and highly susceptible um, uh, plants for flea beetles. So we actually uh, used uh, three application uh, started uh, uh, between three to five days after transplanting. So here you see the list of the materials that we tested. We have about five OMRI listed products, uh, the Entrust, Surround, Pyganic, Ampid, and then the soft oil, those are the OMRI listed. And then we have a Botanicals uh, Mold X. And then we used three conventional insecticide, that's Assail, Warrior, Herbanta. So we use these rates for that. And then we uh, uh, applied those treatment uh, for uh, for ten days interval for cabbage and a weekly interval for pak choy. So we'll re actually uh, repeat this experiment in 2019 to uh, get more consistent results. Here is this uh, slide is showing the 
uh, uh, effectiveness of um, uh, those materials against ca uh, cabbage flea beetle control in cabbage. Uh, this vertical line is showing the mean number of flea beetles per uh, plants, and these the bottom line is showing all those treatments. And this bar is actually the uh, average uh, or mean number from the five observations, five weekly observation, uh, started from August 2nd to the August 30. So these are the means. So here you see this uh, the blue bar on the left. That is for the untreated control. We have a fairly good flea beetle population in our trial. So, uh, so if you if you see those, uh, there are a lot more bars. So just watch those two green circles. That's the warrior and harvanda. If you see that those two materials were uh, significantly good for uh, uh, deterring the cabbage flea beetle on the leaves. These are the counts of uh, flea beetle on the, uh, the plants, the whole uh, plants. Here you see this uh, entrust is circled as yellow. You see that there was a high number of flea beetle on the plants. But when you see the uh, damage um, data, then it tells a different story. So just keep it in mind like you, uh, there were high numbers of flea beetles on there. And here I put any star or surround. For some reason, we found some uh, stunted growth from the surround. But I would like to test this material again, because maybe uh, we may have the wrong uh, rate or something. So that's why I would like to uh, see uh, test this material again this year, like what was the problem there. So, and uh, also the data were collected from 10 heads from each replication. So we used four replications per treatment. So that was actually total 40 plants um, um, observed in a weekly interval. So here, this graph is showing the percent leaf area damage by the flea beetle in cabbage again. And here you see these days when we actually uh, took those uh, like the uh, ratings, the August, uh, 10th, uh, August 23 was right on the vegetative uh, growth, right after the application. Uh, I, I think, okay, so here, here and then the Aug October 3rd, that was actually passed beyond the application. Uh, it, it was just before the harvest. So here I would um, uh, more, uh, uh, I'd give more emphasis on the August 2nd, uh, 10th and then the August 22nd data. Here again, you see this uh, uh, bar is showing, the vertical bar is showing the mean num percent leaf area damage. And then here, these are the insecticide. Again, we found like significantly lower damage uh, on plants treated with Warrior and Harvanta 50SL. Look at that end trust. We found a very high uh, flea beetle population on plants, but when it comes to the uh, leaf damage, that was actually fairly good. Like we, we got very uh, uh, significantly lower damage than the um, uh, other organic treatments, but not as good as the conventional treatment that is normal for an organic materials. And here you see the orange bar, those who are after the second application. So you see that uh, even after the second application, then uh, damage level also was much lower in entrust as well as it was low in the conventional insecticide. But in some other organic materials, uh, we saw a reduction, but it was not that much as the conventional or entrust. But if you compare with the uh, control, you see some reduction. So there are some efficacy going on, except the software X that is not performing very well. And then move on to the Pak Choi. Again, we repeated the trial at the same time. Actually, we did our experiment uh, in June, July, uh, sorry, July, August. And then this bar is showing the mean number of the flea beetle per plants on Pak Choi. And this is again the treatment list. See those two circles. Here again, we got a good flea beetle population on untreated plants. But see the warrior and harvanta. We see the warrior was fairly uh, good in deterring the flea beetle on plants, but the harvanda was not that great. Although in cabbage, we see it was performing better deterring the flea beetle, but in pak choy, it is not that good. I think it's because the pak choy is a very fast growing crops. So there are uh, from, uh, a, it was a weekly interval of uh, insecticide application. So even within one week, there are a lot more new growth. So that might attract some of the 
flavitals to come on this uh, trips. So the other organic materials and even SL, they were not uh, good in deterring the flavitol numbers on pock chai plant. But when we see the percent leaf area damage, again, it is showing the percent. You see the blue line, uh, that was the August 10. Uh, the percent uh, leaf damage was very high. After the application, you see the orange bar, Warrior and Harvanta, they reduced the um, um, uh, damage level uh, pretty good. Even and trust, it also reduced. But the none of the other materials, you see the orange bar, orange bar is actually higher than the uh, after the first application. So that means those are not doing that good when it comes to a fast growing crop uh, and highly susceptible crop like pak choy. So the insects are more uh, attracted to feed uh, on those plants. And then this, uh, the gray bar is after the third application. So in Entrust, even in the Warrior or Harvanta, we see like the Entrust, uh, we see much lower application, so much lower damage. Even the Warrior and Harvanta, it's increased slightly, but not that much compared to the other organic products as well as the control. So then we did a proposed harvest quality evaluation. Uh, just uh, a few days before the harvest, we took out the plants and we measured the head diameter for cabbage and also the head weight for cabbage. So this is after 45 days from the um, uh, third application of those treatments. So, uh, so the head quality is not only on the basis of the uh, treatment uh, application for cabbage flavor. There are a lot more variables that we cannot control. But here you see the blue bar for warrior. So those were somewhat like little bit giving us a little bit bigger head uh, head than the other treatment as well as Antrost is also doing very, uh, uh, giving a slightly bigger head. And head weight, if you see the orange bar, the head weight was also uh, um, uh, uh, good, uh, slightly higher in warrior and Harvanta treated plant as well as in and trust treated plant. When it comes to the uh, the pak choy, the post harvest here, this bar is showing again the pak choy height in inches and then pak choy weight. We did not, uh, we took the weight for uh, the pak choy head, but that was not a consistent uh, data. So that's why we are showing only the pak choy height and pak choy weight. So here again, you see the uh, blue bar for Harvanta and then the Entrust, it is showing slightly uh, uh, higher growth than the other treatment. And then when it comes to uh, uh, the uh, uh, the height, again, we are getting good uh, height for Harvanta as well as for Entrust. So it looks like there are some efficacy with the post harvest quality on, on, on those uh, from those treatment. So I think that was my last slide. Uh, so just Dan mentioned about the row cover. So we actually used a uh, row cover net that is the technique net, not some, uh, somewhat different than the uh, polyester or the spawn bonded polyester because it is more durable and we see very few flea beetle can go fast through those nets so uh, so that was an experiment for our cabbage maggot but still we see good uh, flea beetle can control from those nettings so that's another things to look at in an experimental level but the, obviously that work yeah okay. and and uh, of course the technet netting uh, maybe some other nettings are going to be more durable than the spun bonded polyester. And in this area where we are, deer can be a pretty serious problem getting into fields and putting holes in spun bonded netting. I think the um, the uh, uh, woven netting will hold up a little bit better under those kinds of conditions. So with that, I think we are uh, done and we would be delighted to take any questions you have. Great. Thanks so much, Dan and Farouk, for again, uh, a great presentation of what is known, um, sort of diving into all the research that has been done. Um, so there were a few questions about the material surround, um, which uh, is a, a clay, mm -hmm. a white clay material that sort of just covers the plant. Um, I wonder if you could say a little bit about 
um, how it works and why and um, maybe when it would be best to use? Yeah, well, it's a good question how it works. It's not, I don't think it's really clear. Um, these insects are very oriented to taste or odors and there may be tactile cues or signals that they depend upon. And my understanding is that the kale and clay and surround is interfering with all of that. Um, it may also in some cases just interfere with your ability to stay on the plant. Uh, so that uh, there could be some other issues with them trying to feed and they get a bite of the clay rather than the bite of the plant that uh, deters them. You'll see, uh, I, I went through pretty quickly, but in the UMass uh, trial that surround was used there and this is on Komatsuna, which is uh, a uh, mustard spinach, uh, so leafy brassica. The, one of the problems they saw was it did affect the quality of the plants. Um, it also was not very effective in deterring or controlling flea beetle damage. And it does leave a very strong white residue. So in their paper, and you could read that, I could even get that to you if you're interested, uh, they had objections to uh, surround for those reasons. So on a, um, a different kind of a crop, maybe cabbage or heading, heading um, brassica, cauliflower, um, that might not be such of an issue, but I'd like to see better data on showing it to be effective. Now, Fruit did use surround. He did get a, a reduction in the flea beetle damage or infestation, but he also had pretty significant stunting associated with that treatment. Um, so I guess if I was going to use surround, I would use it early when the white residue would not be an issue and not be remaining on the marketable part of the crop. Um, it can be very sludgy, so you'll need constant agitation and you'll need to maybe remove the screens in your nozzles to get the material to go out okay. Um, so there's been uh, some complaints about that just because of the nature of the kind of the material it is, but if you can have good agitation and you can get it through the nozzle, uh, maybe uh, use an appropriate aperture size, um, not something that's really tiny, uh, you'll, you'll probably be okay with the, with, the, uh, with the application. Yeah, this is something that I've worked with um, growers on in my role as an extension educator and um, have found that farmers find it useful for protecting the transplants when they go out. Um, and like if you can't cover all of your brassica acreage, this is just another option. And um, one thing that we're hoping to make over the summer and put up on the website is a video about how to mix this stuff because farmers have figured out some sort of ways to get it really mixed up well, which seems to um, definitely impact how well it works and how how mm -hmm. what how good of coverage you can get with it yes, and um, it's out of uh, suspension pretty quickly so that's why constant agitation is really needed um constant shaking if you're doing it like a backpack or or um if you have uh, a sprayer that has a an agitator in, inside um or has a return hose that provides a jet agitation kind of a of an effect yeah, definitely. Um, so other spray related questions were um, if you could also sort of describe what is Bovaria bassiana that you mentioned in one of your early slides and also MET52, which um, wow. in that slide you showed that a combination of the Bovaria and the MET52 canola yeah. worked pretty well. Yeah, Bovaria bassiana is actually the product you know of as Mycotrol or Botanigard. The Mycotrol is the SO is the organic version. The Botanigard is is one that's actually more known in the world of ornamentals. But it's the same uh, kind of fungus, and this is a natural insect killing fungus that's found in soil. Uh, this is a particular strain that has been isolated and uh, developed for use in in pest management. Um, and the material that was used was a Mycotrol product in that trial that I reported on. The MET52 is Metarizium, used to be called Metarizium anisopoli. It's, uh, I believe, or, or also known as Metarizium burnium. 
and this is a strain of another insect killing fungus that um, has mostly been used as um, a way of controlling soil-borne insects. Um, we've used it, say, for black line weevil. Uh, it works quite well, uh, surprisingly well. Um, doesn't work for white grubs, but it does work for black line weevil. Um, and uh, we've used it as, as a foliar application for other pests too. Right now, the product is not labeled for use on brassicas. It does have other vegetables on the label, like tomatoes, and hence also some small fruit. Um, and it would be used as a spray. In a particular trial on canola, it was being experimented with. They had first put an application of bovaria, meaning the mycotrol out, and then they followed 15 days later with the metarizium, the MET-52 spray. That's how they did that. Um, so I don't know whether the company will be pursuing or is pursuing a broadening of the MET-52 label, but you certainly now can use Mycotrol. Uh, it is labeled for use on brassicas uh, and for flea beetles too. Okay, great. Um, there were a few questions about um, the row covers also. Um, just uh, if you had any particular um, advice about how best to deploy and secure them um, if there's an issue with um, flea beetles emerging from under the covers um, and let's see if there's anything else here yeah so you could just say a little bit more about um, how to use those effectively sure i think there's a, a whole array of issues <laughs> to deal with and i'm actually hoping that some of uh, the growers um, online will be telling us uh, the best ways of doing this. Um, I think we'll all put our heads together at some point and uh, compare notes and see what we like best. Um, I, um, <laughs> I, there's different ways of deploying them or using them, and it is definitely an issue if you have flea beetles emerging underneath there, um, they could be a problem. So ideally it would be on rotated ground, um, although I have to say that we have been putting out the netting in our trials on ground that was not rotated and we haven't had much of a problem um, because they're not really overwintering as adults in this uh, in the uh, tilled areas. They're probably overwintering in the hedgerow in the weedy areas outside the field. So at least in the springtime, um, it hasn't been a problem probably for that reason. Um, Farouk is, and I've been discussing this, and Farouk is looking into maybe using the uh, the netting in combination with plastic mulch, uh, where you might have two or three rows of, say, cabbage or some some you know valuable more valuable heading kind of brassica to deal with the weed management issue that you would have. I do know of growers that are using it right now for raising transplants. Um, so if you have a transplant bed, uh, and this is mainly they're thinking cabbage maggot, but they, you could use it for flea beetles as well. And you could put uh, a section of row cover over a smaller transplant bed um, and hold it down with whatever you have on hand, uh, irrigation piping, um, you know, bags of soil or whatever is easy to keep the edges um, on the soil or even buried underneath. I don't know if Rick, you have any other comments on that. Yeah. Uh, yes, like that. Uh, other things that are, um, whether the flea beetle will be emerging from the ground uh, under the net cover. What we uh, we uh, did like we planted those uh, cabbage uh, transplant like sometimes in the first week of May, like the tenth or eleventh or second week of May, tenth or eleventh May. At that time, the flea beetle population was not that much, so mm -hmm. that might we might not have you know, getting any. So we can use that uh, similar th um, like things to following the flea beetle emergence pattern. Like okay, so uh, there is a break between the uh, the overwintering emergence and the so summer emergence. So if there is a low population at some point in June or uh, that could be a mm -hmm, time mm -hmm. when you want to put or early in the season when the flea yeah. beetles are not. And I think you might, you could have an issue with them emerging, say, if you are relay cropping or uh, onto the same ground. So you just um, uh, harvested the broccoli off and you planted a new broccoli planting on the same ground. Well, you in theory could have flea beetle 
larvae that are feeding on the roots of the former crop that have just finished developing at the time uh, you've uh, planted the new broccoli over the top of that. And should you put a row cover over it, you could easily have adults emerging from underneath. This would be more during the, um, you know, for the uh, uh, summer generation. So that would be probably the time I'd be a little more concerned if you were not rotating in the summertime. Um, that brings up another question uh, that has come up about um, timing of different peaks in the summer. Um, and if there are times when there aren't as many flea beetles, I think we get that question a lot too. People think that they kind of go away later in the season. Um, in my experience, I'm just curious because in my experience out there counting, there they seem to always be some flea beetles out there. So I wonder if you have more information about the the peaks that yeah. might see. Us alone. Yeah, th that that's happened with us uh, uh, yeah. last year, like. When we planted our cabbage, uh, sometimes in the late July, there was no flea beetle. So then we decided to uh, put a pak choy experiment. Because we thought that, OK, maybe we will not be getting mm -hmm. our, uh, mm -hmm. in our field, there were no flea beetle. But the a field, like about several hundred meters away, there was, an, um, I think, cauliflower there. And then that field was filled with the flea beetle. So it's always a puzzle, like when is the actual peak? Yeah, so that's... and we were we were gambling a little, um, playing Las Vegas around here uh, with the pak choy, hoping that flea beetles would rise again, and they they didn't disappoint us. Uh, but I guess I don't have a really good answer for that. Um, I, I tried to find some information on seasonality of the populations of biology, and I didn't turn up anything at least easily. Um, I'm going to see if I could find that again. I need to probably spend just more time digging. Um, I would say try to keep records and over a period of some years, it should hopefully become a little clearer. That's what we would do. Um, but it does vary considerably from year to year. We've had years when the flea beetle populations were not cooperating. Um, and um, I'm not sure why that is. So we definitely see problems later in May and we've had some- um, In August also. Yep, and, and then um, I run trials timing it for late, Ju uh, late June into July and had very good results with the flea beetle, with huge flea beetle numbers. And then um, we've also seen them continuing into August. So um, there are definitely peaks and valleys in that, um, but I don't think I can really describe that as well as I would like. And it's uh, and, uh, to, to any satisfaction anyway. Yeah, I feel similarly about that. Um... It does bring up another question. People are um, asking about kind of the the some biology questions like um, where do they overwinter? Uh, you mentioned probably not right in the field, but where mm -hmm. and what life stage are they at during their overwintering period? And then um, are, are there any, we've talked about this in the other webinars too, are there any impacts of weather like in a drought year, would they be worse than a wet year, or do they prefer um, hot or cold weather? Are they more active um, on sunny days, that kind of thing? Yeah, those are, good. those are all good questions. And I tried to find information on um, anything very specific where somebody actually looked for them uh, to see where they exactly were overwintering. and all of I could find were just anecdotal comments on where they're thought or believed to overwinter, meaning in uh, hedgerow areas among weedy plants, uh, uh, debris, crop debris or trash in, in, uh, on, in field areas. They didn't, there was no very explicit data showing where any were found. Um, and I've heard the same thing with cucumber beetle, but the adults are the stage that overwinter for both striped and and Christopher, and, uh, um, and Christopher flea beetles. Um, um, I don't know of any uh, data or research showing how weather conditions impact these uh, their populations. It almost certainly has an effect, but what that is and how it is is a mystery to me. Um, but there must be some factors that are acting on them just to create these fluctuations that we see from year to year. 
Um, I don't know what those would be. Uh, cold temperature doesn't seem to be the issue, at least not obvious to me. Um, we've had high populations after years with snow cover and with no snow cover. So it's not clear to me that that is playing a role. Um, I, I would think that high moisture levels could possibly impact them, but that's not been very clearly uh, elucidated either. So uh, a lot of mysteries uh, in my mind about what um, impacts uh, there are on flea beetle populations. And I don't know if any of our uh, panelists have anything to add on that. I'd be interested to hear what they have to say. Yeah, do any of the other collaborators have any um, thing to weigh in on about the sort of biology here? Um, if not, our next question is uh, about the trap cropping. And um, so you're, you mentioned using sort of a mustard trap crop and that you have to sort of manage that a little bit. Um, to make it work and discuss an idea of um, successions of the trap. Mm -hmm. um, one question was, um, do you just set the trap out and hopefully that's just more attractive or do you also treat mm -hmm. the trap crop area with some insecticide? Um, the Washington State uh, paper talked a little bit about that. They indicated that they did not treat their trap crop, but and had, uh, um, they feel that that um, did reduce the damage to the uh, cash crop, the uh, broccoli they were growing was reduced regardless. They did suggest that treating that trap crop would be um, maybe a good idea. And I think it probably is, uh, certainly at least to reduce the population, you could use one of the more effective uh, conventional materials would be my suggestion um, because in trust is maybe not actually killing them but maybe deterring their feeding more um, so um, it would be probably better to use one of the more effective materials on the trap crop if um, if you were able to do that in, in a more conventional kind of a setting there's not a lot of really good explicit guidelines on how you actually implement that um, just some suggestions from the work that had been done. Uh, they mentioned that the trap crop worked whether it was 36 or 1.6 feet away. You could have it quite close or quite far, uh, relatively speaking. <laughs> Not in the next county, of course, but um, you could. Uh, it didn't seem to matter how close or, uh, or far it was from the uh, um, crop that's grown for sale. But I think more of that needs to be looked into. Um, and made into a little bit more formulaic. Uh, so which specific trap crops would you grow and how would you frequently would you replant them so that you have a good number in succession each time? And some of these are very, very fast growing like the pak choy that we've used in our trials. So um, you might need to have a regular weekly or 10 day kind of a schedule to make sure there's always good amount of trap crop that's um, attractive. So we don't really have, I would say, very clear guidelines on it, just some concept at this point and some evidence that they do help. Okay, thanks. Um, I can say in my experience trying to set up some brassica research trials, I always am so focused on that. Um, and then I go to plant and I realize, oh no, well, how am I gonna control flea beetles? And I try to set up a trap crop at that point and it takes you know 14 days or whatever to grow at all so i would just say you got to plan ahead and make mm -hmm. sure that you um, get the crop in there before the cash crop um well, keep in another mind, you're going to be laying eggs in that cash crop too so um focus not just on what you're doing about the adults and what they're doing but think about maybe um, would there be a way of tilling under, destroying, affecting the larval stage on the roots of that cash crop as well? So as you have the successional uh, cash crops coming on, um, how are you going to deal with the old one? And could that help and contribute to reducing the problem? Okay. Um, another question was about um, brassica cover crops. Um, people are 
using um, bees more and more possibly. And Actually, have we seen flea beetles on on brassica cover crops? Mm -hmm. Well, they certainly like them just fine. We've had tillage radish growing here, and it's great. It's a really nice crop. Um, and I'm sort of glad because it seems to be helping sustain the uh, flea beetle population for our trials. Um, not, uh, not great I, for growers, though. Uh, no, of course, it's horrible for growers. <laughs> but um, and there's a lot of good reasons to grow some brassica cover crops. Um, you know, there's uh, some impact on soil pathogens and pests that, that they may have that would be a great advantage or, or helpful. Um, so I don't know that we've um, got a good answer on that one either, uh, but it does seem that they can contribute to the problem, but to what extent um, is a little bit unclear to me right now. Um, and I'm talking with our our vegetable horticulturist, Santa Menasha, about this. We're very aware that this is an issue, that if people are going to be growing more of this, could you actually be increasing the problem? Or could there be a way to um, work this in against the flea beetles? Um, remember, this is something they're highly attracted to. So could you turn it into a fatal attraction uh, in some way, maybe through tilling it under um, in a timely fashion, um, you know, or, or timing it and planting and so forth. So uh, I think stay tuned is the answer, uh, but it's definitely on my radar and something we've been thinking about. Okay. Um, I just wanted to mention we had a comment from Ruth Hazard, who you mentioned did a lot of this research with her um, colleague Karen Anderson uh, a few years back. And she says that uh, Karen did study the overwintering habitat and found um, they overwinter as adults in the field, but um, sorry, did not find the adults in the field, but did find them in adjacent brush and woods. Um, so just wanted to mention that. And one maybe last question is early in your presentation, you listed a bunch of different management strategies that people talk about but might not be well supported. And one was intercropping with some plants like uh, tansy or catnip. And I wonder if um, you might say a little bit more about how that would work. Are those, you know, interplanting but not with a more attractive crop like in the trap cropping mon model but what are what are those plants doing that are contributing to possibly less flea beetles around that's a good question and that wasn't really very well speculated in the paper uh about how that could be contributing it, it might be just that you're thinning out and not having solid brassicas over an entire landscape area um and that um adding in, in a flea beetle's perspective, uh, a little more of an obstruction or um, something that's in their way, making their lives a little harder to find their favorite host crops by planting other things in between. I can't think of any other way that that would really work. Um, certainly these are giving off volatile and other chemicals, but they're not hosts for any of these flea beetles. Um, and that's, I think, probably part of the secret is that they just... Crop. Yeah, you're just planting them in between um, and not having such a dense planting of the uh, um, um, of the brassicas uh, in the field. I can certainly share that paper with anybody that's interested. If you'd like, um, maybe send it up to Sue or I'll, I'll send her a copy of the paper and um, and uh, be glad to have you read more about the details of what they did. Yeah, I think that's a, a good uh, place to end because I um, want to mention again that we do have this website where we'll be posting all these webinars, but also a lot of other research uh, reports that we, we're doing, um, the seven or so of us on this grant project. Um, but also we can post other resources like fact sheets, scouting sheets, and um, link to other um, reports that might be of interest to folks. So. Um, this is, we're going into year two of this three-year project, and so keep checking back on that um, Brassica Pest Collaborative page on um, the UMass Extension Vegetables site for more resources. So I think with that, I'll say thank you so much to Dan and Farouk for the presentation today and for 
all of your questions and for your participation over the last couple of weeks in our seminar series. I hope Thank you've you. enjoyed it. Good luck to everybody. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye.